we usually uh, held regularly on Mondays. And uh, today we have our guest, Edward Lemon, who is uh, a research assistant professor at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University, Washington DC teaching site. Uh, he's also a president of the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs. Uh, his research uh, focuses mostly on security issues in Central Asia. Uh, and uh, Dr. Lehman has previously held positions in the, the Wilson Center and Columbia University. And uh, Dr. Lehman will be talking today about the patterns of protest in Central Asia during a time of COVID. So this is a very important topic because uh, many countries right now uh, go through the pandemic and uh, we could observe uh, lots of protests across uh, different CIS states, uh, Belarus and Russia. And um, uh, of course, uh, we should discuss uh, what are the implications of this protest. So um, uh, Edward Lemon will present for 25, 30 minutes and then uh, we will have a Q&A session after his presentation, okay? Uh, Dr. Lemon, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Dr. Sharipova. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, when we think of security issues in Central Asia, we often think first of Islamic extremism and terrorism. But when we think back to some of the most significant moments within the political history of the region since 1991, and even before that, what is at the center of those events is often protests. We think back to the beginning of the Tajik civil war in the spring of 1992, where we had a standoff between two opposing protests in the center of Dushanbe that eventually turned violent and led to the, uh, the region's most significant political unrest that lasted for five years. If we think back to Kyrgyzstan, where we've now seen revolutions and overthrows of governments by the people in 2005, 2010, and most recently in October, all protests that emerged at times of elections that were challenged by the people. Uh, we think back to um, events in Uzbekistan, where in 2005, we saw a violent response to an, a rare protest in the country in Andijan against the detention of um, a number of businessmen resulting in the deaths of hundreds of people and Uzbekistan after criticism from the West turning away from uh, you know its relationship with the United States and throwing um, the United States out of its military base there and um, also uh, kicking out most of the Western NGOs in the country. So protests in Central Asia um, have been very key drivers of um, political change be that positive change in terms of you know, creating openings for more space for civil society or negative change in terms of being uh, the precursors to um, a, a sort of repression in the country. So today I'm gonna to talk about a new data set that I've collected in collaboration with a, a, a quite a large team of colleagues um, who won't be speaking today, but I would like to give them credit. They include Bradley Jardin, um, Ravshan, Jandayeva, who's actually a graduate of Nazarbayev University and now writing her PhD, um, starting her PhD at George Washington University here in Washington, DC. Um, Sher Hashimov, uh, Aruke uh, Urhan Kizi, so a team of, of, of mostly Central Asian researchers. And we've assembled a data set since 2018 of protests in Central Asia. And this is called the Central Asia Protest Tracker. It's available um, on the website of Oxford Society, of which I'm president, which is a new research focused um, nonprofit organization based here in Washington, DC, that aims to build collaborations and research connections and understanding um, of Central Asia. Um, and the data set itself focuses on protests in the region. By protests, we mean actions that are a public expression of objection towards an idea or action of an individual or institution, including state organs, businesses, organizations, foreign governments, which happens in physical space. So I'll talk a moment in a moment about some of the things that we don't include, but what we are including in this data set are things like pickets, strikes, um, marches, demonstrations, um, all of which happen in, 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 in physical space. So in places like 
centers the center of Nur Sultan um, near some of the government buildings um, or in the center of uh, Bishkek, for example, Alatur Square, which has been obviously an epicenter of protest in the country. So I'll go through sort of exactly what we found in a moment, but we've so far between 2018 and 2020 found 1577 protests in Central Asia. As I'll say in a moment, that doesn't mean that that's the total number of protests. That just means that's the total number of protests that we found through open source searches. So searches through local news websites, searches through, in some cases, sort of social media reporting from Twitter, Instagram, and other sources. Um, we've supplemented this with another similar data set, which is called ACLED, where we've drawn certain, they have a different mandate and they focus on different things, but they do also identify protests around the world. And so we've managed to identify and plug the gaps in our data with some of their sources and then coded it to fit our data set. Each of the protests is coded by location, where it took place using a geocode, um, the date, the protest type ranging, as I said, from things like marches to hunger strikes, um, the issue around people which people mobilized, and we have 28 different issues that we've coded these protests for, including issues such as COVID-19, issues such as elections, issues such as property, issues such as human rights. So we have various different issue, issue types that we code each protest around, coding them with up to three different issues that people have mobilized around the target type. So as I said, ranging from mostly, in most cases, local or national governments, but in other cases, foreign businesses, um, in some cases, even foreign governments. Um, and then we code around the, the groups linked. So that could be um, a particular opposition politician who's mobilized protesters, or it could be an opposition party um, or group. Obviously in the case of Kazakhstan, a number of protest sort of social movements have emerged in recent years. Like or in Kazakhstan and various others. And then the target response. So the way in which the target of the protest responds, did they respond violently by arresting people and using tear gas, or did they make some form of concession um, and promise to resolve the situation? And we've mapped these all out onto an interactive map that you can see, I think, on the next slide, whereby you can click on one of these numbers and zoom in. And then you can see here in Jazgaz Gun, um, you know, there were four protests uh, around the center of the city. Um, and in this case, you know, we have a protest around um, and issues with the financial sector um, about a housing people from a state, residents from a state subsidized housing project protesting outside their homes against mandatory eviction, which has been a major issue, um, not only in Kazakhstan, but also especially in Uzbekistan, as I'll talk about in a moment. So we've taken these 1,577 protests put them on this interactive map to help us map the spatial patterns of protest in Central Asia. So what sort of research questions were we interested in answering through this? Um, you know, I think first sort of what issues do citizens mobilize around? It's been interesting to observe, um, you know, the, 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 how those issues have changed over time. Um, and I'll come to that in a moment. We are also interested in the geographic patterns of protests, you know, which particular regions of different countries are becoming more, uh, have more prominent numbers of protests. For example, um, in Tajikistan, whilst protests are rare, many of the protests that we've recorded in our data set have, have happened in the Pamir, in, in the, the east of the country, um, which has its own sort of uh, difficult relationship with, with the central government and uh, its own language and, and own religion. And so that, that's been sort of a, a, an area where we've seen more protests in other places. We've obviously seen a, a large numbers of protests in, in urban areas such as, such as Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. We're also interested in how the targets of the protests have responded. You know, to what degree are different governments uh, using violence against protesters? Um, and then lastly, sort of what variables lead to, a, to the target of a protest using violence or using a more constructive response. We've actually run some regression analysis, which I'll run through at the end. So what are the limitations? I think when we're constructing these data sets, we always have to be humble, humble about what they can say and what they can't say. So first of all, as I've said, we can't claim that this is every single protest in the region that have, that's happened since 2018. The real number is obviously higher. 
obviously there are certain protests that are happening that aren't deemed newsworthy or there's no one there to record them. There are all many other forms of resistance. Is what, what, um, what James Scott's called hidden transcripts, right? The ways in which people resist and uh, voice objection um, you know, often happens in more hidden ways. We don't record online protests. We don't record petitions. So it's all these different forms of resistance and protests that we're not capturing within our protest tracker. Our protest tracker is really focused on sort of de demonstrations um, and uh, strikes, marches, other things that are happening, um, happening in physical space and are reported on. So of course, you know, we don't capture all forms of resistance in the region. We also can't answer certain questions. You know, we are not um, at this stage interviewing people, um, going out and talking to people who are attending demonstrations to ask precisely why they mobilize. And there are a number of people doing excellent work on this, including Sel uh, Dulot Geldeva in Kyrgyzstan, Elmer uh, Satibaldieva, who's um, based based in the UK but originally from Kyrgyzstan, Asmat Tibakulov, uh, and Medet Tuligyanov, um, amongst many others. And so, you know, we're hoping we're going to start some collaborations with them, uh, their anthropologists, political scientists, sociologists who are looking at protests, but conducting interviews uh, using qualitative methods and to understand why people are mobilizing or what's motivating them. Instead, we can sort of talk about the ways in which people mobilize around certain issues um, rather than precisely why an individual decides they're going to attend a protest, for example. So there are some of the limitations of what we can say. So in terms of the data, and again, um, you know, the, the, this data set is, as I said, not complete. So we have to be careful with, with some of the statements here. But I think, you know, overall, we can point to a rising number of protests in the region um, across, across most of the countries. Um, so particularly, um, Kazakhstan that's seen, you know, a number of a spike in protests since the, the resignation of the first president um, or the retirement of the first president in March 2019. Um, and we've really seen, as you can see, a spike in protests. Again, I would say I wouldn't compare the numbers between Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan in particular, because, um, you know, in Kyrgyzstan protests in general have been more common. And, um, you know, the official statistics that are put out by the government of Kyrgyzstan put the number of protests a lot higher than the number we're capturing in our data set. But I think what we can certainly do with our data set is compare countries themselves over time, um, but comparisons between different countries um, may be less, um, less useful. Also, the fact that there are, you know, only 29 protests in Tajikistan, 18 protests in Turkmenistan certainly doesn't mean those governments are um, uh, doing a better job. Um, and, quite the opposite, you know, I think it points to the fact that citizens there are repressed and, and don't feel able to protest. We'll come to that point at the end. But as you can see, you know, we're seeing within our data set a rise from only 164 protests captured in 2018 to 998 captured in 2020. And that's in spite of COVID-19, in spite of the lockdown um, that, that occurred in most of the countries across the region. So we are seeing uh, a rising protest mood, we could say. So what's happening in each country and what, what are people mobilizing around? I think, you know, from, from the data, you know, emerges a real sort of different sort of, you could say protest feel in each country. The dynamic of many of the protests seems a little, uh, feels, feels quite similar. Of course, Kazakhstan, has had within the data set 780 protests. So, um, you know, it accounts for just um, under half, actually almost exactly half of the protests that we've captured within the data set. Most of the protests that we've captured are around human rights and human rights, you know, within our coding includes sort of protests around, um, you know, uh, people calling for greater rights in general. So this is movements who've come out and called for reforms within the country. Um, and so, you know, they've accounted for just, just under, I think, 200 protests in the country. So that's you know, almost a, just over a quarter of the protests in the country have been people mobilizing around sort of desire for changes, um, reform in the country. Another issue that people have mobilized around is, is, is welfare. We all sort of know the sort of one of the um, 
reasons for, um, or at least the stated reasons for Nazarbayev's retirement in March 2019 was the obviously the fire, as we know, and the sort of growing protest mood that we were seeing even before then, especially amongst the women with multiple children on them, the, the, the families of uh, multiple children, um, mothers of multiple children. Um, and so we've seen, you know, quite a number of protests mobilizing around calls for the state to do more to help um, individuals. And that's also linked to income and incomes become, um, income is, is, is often related to COVID-19. And so we've seen the highest number of protests around COVID-19 in Kazakhstan. Of course, Kazakhstan also has the largest population in Central Asia. So that's also uh, tempers the fact that it, we have more observations in our data set, but we have seen you know, a number of protests around, you know, as we've seen in other parts of the world, including the United States, people protesting against lockdown measures you know, because their businesses have been closed. So that's the sort of feel that we've seen in terms of the issues in Kazakhstan. In Kyrgyzstan, we've obviously seen during our time uh, frame that we're working with one revolution, if we can label it that, certainly an overthrow of the government um, back in October 2020. And so elections, and this is these were really mostly protests that occurred immediately after the elections at the beginning of October, where we saw, you know, almost 150 protests happening in one week. So that's really skewed the data set um, in Kyrgyzstan towards having lots of elections protests. So immediately after the, um, after the parliamentary elections back in October, we saw obviously a contested outcome and mass protests across the country. Some of these were sort of peaceful protests, but many of them were, um, you know, more violent acts of seizing government buildings and, and in other cases, economic assets. Um, another issue that's been important in Kyrgyzstan has been justice. Um, so the workings of the, the, the court um, court system, people calling for individuals to be given a fair trial. And then, you know, an, another series of economic issues that we've seen in the other countries, such as income and land. In Uzbekistan, we've seen a, a, a large uptick in protests. You know, I think this is a product in many ways of the more um, open political system um, that is being developed under Mirziyoyev, who came to power almost five years ago, um, as he's sort of charted a course of softening repression and opening up the political space, you know, making statements like he did last week of sort of calling on, calling journalists and bloggers his brothers who he was looking to for you know, feedback, criticism, and, you know, as a sort of, you know, a, as, as a force to help the government improve its services. Well, obviously, by opening up that space, we have seen the, what would be called in the political science, science, science literature, the opportunity structure for protests sort of changing, right? And we've seen before, obviously, we saw the repression of protests in Andrzej, for example. And now under Mirziyoyev, we've, in fact, um, we've seen the government of Uzbekistan not only tolerating protests, but also reacting to them in, in constructive ways in many cases, um, offering concessions. So that's certainly an interesting um, development to witness and something that would have been a, a, unimaginable, I think, um, five years ago. But really the main issues, two main issues that people are mobilizing around in, in, in Kyrgyzstan, and the first is related to sort of property and development as the country is pushing through sort of urban, regeneration plans, um, as is happening in other parts of Central Asia, but it's happening particularly quickly in, in, in Uzbekistan. Um, people are being um, oftentimes evicted from their properties. They're learning that they didn't own the land that they thought they did, that they built their houses on. Um, and they're having, the, the government is often evicting them and, and throwing them off their property. And they're often reacting in violent ways, um, you know, number of attacks on people from banks coming to requisition properties. Um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing quite a lot of, of resistance to the government's attempted modernization plans. The other issue, as you can see from this photo, is utilities. Um, you know, again, not a problem just for Uzbekistan. Anyone, my colleagues uh, in Texas obviously experienced a very cold week last week where most of them were without power. In fact, I myself thought I might not be able to attend today because my whole building lost power yesterday, um, right up until about 10 p.m. And I was thinking I wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to log on this morning. Um, so certainly not a problem unique to Uzbekistan, but certainly you know as um, you know uh, the, the the infrastructure for gas 
particularly gas and uh, gas supply throughout the country is, is, is quite antiquated. Obviously, it comes from, dates back from the Soviet Union, and many people have found themselves without gas supplies, without heat, um, in the, particularly, obviously, in the winter months. And so we've seen a number of protests, and many times people going out onto roads and blocking, uh, physically blocking traffic as a way to draw attention to themselves. This is one of the more dramatic incidents in this photo, I think, that took place in, uh, I think, in Karpakistan. Um, where people are obviously burning tires, blocking roads, and, and trying to draw attention to themselves. So that's sort of the main feel of the protests in Uzbekistan. Of course, for Tajikistan and, and Turkmenistan, we have far fewer protests. So, you know, only a total of 29 and 18 in the case of Tajikistan and, and Turkmenistan. And so it's lim there's a limit to what we can say about protests in these countries. In fact, some of the protests in Tajikistan have been, a number of them, have been pro-governmental, you know, with sort of pseudo, sort of pro-government pro NGOs and youth movements, um, you know, uh, protesting outside of embassies who've uh, given asylum to political um, activists or members of the Islamic Renaissance Party that was banned in 2015. So when the genuine protests have taken place, most of them have taken place in Horog, in, or in the Pamir region, which you can see in this photo, one of the largest protests in the country in recent years in 2018. Um, and these have been against government attempts to um, uh, gain more control over the autonomous region, the Gulnabadakshan autonomous region, autonomous oblast. Um, and in many cases, they've been response, they've been a specific dynamic of targeting law enforcement. Um, so which we've coded as being repression, people being arrested um, or being stopped by uh, traffic police and then reacting um, violently and then being arrested and then leading to protests. So we've seen most of the mobilization happening in a part of the country that is sort of more independent from the center um, and where there's specific tension between law enforcement and uh, the people. Tetmenistan is an interesting one to observe. Of course, we have very few sources of information of what's happening in Turkmenistan. Um, we rely on um, Radio Free Europe's Turkmen service and some of the uh, other exiled media um, outlets that are based outside of the country. And of course, it's, it's, it's difficult to get information and, and, and a complete picture of what's going on. But certainly within our data set, we've seen a massive uptick in protests, at least reported protests, more recently, even within the second half of 2020. And in most cases, people are mobilizing around welfare and food issues. The government of Turkmenistan, even before COVID-19, you know, had already stopped or scaled back certain programs for subsidizing flour and other staple goods, subsidizing fuel, um, which was sort of something they'd done since independence as a way of placating the population because they had started to run out of money, um, they had already started cutting some of those programs. And that's obviously become even more pronounced during COVID-19. And so we've seen lots of protests around people not being able to buy flour and other food, um, that we've, and, or protests around people calling on the government to provide them with more welfare and support. And as in many of the other countries, you know, um, you know, it's often from the, the observations we reports that we have is often women who are taking the lead in this activism and there's some very interesting literature on specifically on the role of women protesters by some of the authors that I mentioned before um, that look at sort of some of the, the gendered aspects of this mobilization so in most cases it's been groups of women who've uh, often confronted local officials um, quite sort of got up in their face and, and sort of uh, demanded that they provide them with more support so I think that's an interesting observation in terms of sort of you know, rising, rising tension, tension in Turkmenistan. So there are sort of some of the issues we're seeing people mobilize around, and we can talk about that in the, the Q&A. Um, how have the targets responded? You know, as I say, most times the targets are government, but they're not always governments. In some cases, they're businesses and other uh, entities. And as you can see from these different pie charts, you know, we've seen um, the use of, of, of violence most frequently in, in Kazakhstan, although it's not a majority of protests, it's around 17% of protests being broken up violently with people being arrested or um, 
uh, or uh, kettled, you know, prevented from moving, or uh, or violently dispersed. Uh, we've seen lower levels of, of violent response in Kyrgyzstan, where obviously the protests are more normalized and tolerated by the government. Um, and you know, we've seen relatively few instances in, in Uzbekistan as well. As I said, we've seen the most sort of constructive responses in Uzbekistan, 41% of protests. Um, and, you know, also, you know, relatively constructive responses in many cases in, in Kazakhstan as well. Um, we also coded a number of other ones that were in between, including cautious, which was sort of, you know, if the police are just monitoring the protest and standing nearby, but they don't intervene. Um, that was what we, we sort of, um, we, we, we coded in that way and they're neutral where sometimes we didn't know because there wasn't enough information um, how the target responded. Um, and in other cases, you know, they, um, they uh, maybe uh, met with protesters, but nothing, nothing happened afterwards. So, as I said, we were interested in what, if, what, what, what factors affect this response, what explains why certain protests are broken up in a violent way and what affects why certain protests are, um, are uh, dealt with in a constructive manner. So we developed a number of regression models, logistic regression models um, to determine the probability of either a violent or a constructive response in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan because we didn't have enough observations for the other two countries. So we developed two logistic regression models. The first was about the likelihood of a constructive response and the second was about the likelihood of, of uh, violence. And we coded these against a, a, a number of independent variables from our data set. So the first was location using our geocode. We managed to code protests around where they took place. And so according to our um, regression analysis, you know, we saw that holding a protest in, in Bishkek, for example, is associated with a 300% increase in the probability of a violent response um, and 83% decrease in the probability of a constructive response. Um, perhaps due to the fact that it's, you know, in the center, center of the city, it's been where we've seen some of the more significant protests in the country, um, obviously threatening uh, government buildings that were defended, needed to be defended by, by the government. And then similar, Similar uh, situation in, in Kazakhstan, where we saw holding a protest in North Sultan uh, was associated with a 171% increase in the probability of a violent response by the target. So seemingly, from what our findings indicate, you know, protesting in the capital cities, large urban areas was more risky uh, for the protesters, increased the risk of being violently suppressed. One of the more significant findings, I think, um, was that the groups who were linked to the protest mattered. Um, so a connection with opposition groups um, was associated with a 63% decrease in the probability of a constructive response in Kyrgyzstan, and in Kazakhstan, a 900% increase in the probability of a violent response. So protests linked to Democratic um, Party of Kazakhstan, Democratic Choice of Kazakhstan, um, we on Kazakhstan, some of these other movements that have obviously been um, labeled as, as, as obviously in, in some cases labeled as extremists by the government, um, that dramatically increases the chances of being repressed. And in fact, most of the violent responses we've seen, you know, the, the images that have um, appeared in, you know, around the world of, of protesters being broken up by police have often been at these, these rallies. So. Um, I guess a rather intuitive finding there that you know, being linked to some of these open political parties um, maybe raises the uh, threat threat perception of the government of Kazakhstan and leads them to use more violent tactics. Again, certainly not unique to Kazakhstan, something we've seen being used most definitely not very far away from where I'm sitting in, by the White House in the United States. And obviously, in, in other parts of other parts of the United States and and, uh, and the West, um, and then finally, sort of the protest type. So we were interested in whether the protest type um, had an impact on um, the uh, response. And again, we found that you know 
again, another intuitive finding was that if protesters use violence and violent means, um, then it was more likely that the state would use violence against them or the target would use violence against them. Um, you know, um, so we saw a 72% decrease in the probability of a constructive response in Kyrgyzstan um, and a 413% uh, increase in the probability of a violent response from the government in the case of, the case of Kazakhstan. So we saw, you know, if again, um, this sort of pattern of reciprocal violent acts, um, you know, and often, you know, it's difficult, it's difficult to say who started that violence, you know, in many cases, it's protests turn violent when it's when when protesters are repressed by the government, as we saw, you know, more recently in, in October in, in Kyrgyzstan, where it was, you know, it was the police who initiated that sort of cycle. So what are some of the policy implications? Um, Dr. Sharipova asked me to speak a little bit about this. Of course, it's, it's, it's rather difficult um, to address these because you know, these, are, these are very high level issues and there, there are many different issues at play here. Um, you know, some of the issues that protesters are mobilizing around are easier to address than others. You know, talking about reforming the entire um, government is, is one thing, obviously talking about addressing one very specific issue such as, you know, uh, interest rates is, is, is slightly easier. Um, but as I said, you know, I think protests do appear to be on the rise in Central Asia. Um, I think, you know, there are a number of causes for this, but I think, you know, pointing at a macro level to two of them is maybe useful. And the first I think is, you know, the spaces that have been opened for opposition and resistance by transition. Transition in Kazakhstan from Nazarbayev to Tokayev, uh, in Kyrgyzstan obviously from um, uh, Jinbekov to, um, to Japarov, and in Uzbekistan from Karimov to Mirzioyev. You know, these are all transitions that have taken place over the past five years. And in each case, we've seen resistance to those transitions or an opening as a result of those transitions that's allowed for more protests to take place. So I think sort of this concept of contested transitions is um, you know, one of the major reasons we've seen an, an uptick in protests from 2018 through to 2020. Um, you know, I think second, obviously, you know, somewhat initially sort of counterintuitive finding was the fact that, you know, I think uh, maybe when we started collecting this data at the beginning of the lockdown, you know, almost almost a year ago, you know, I was expecting there to be obviously very few protests during the lockdown in each of the countries themselves. But really what we've seen, particularly in since 2020, is obviously a, an uptick in protests, many of them linked to COVID-19. Some of them we've coded directly, you know, about 10% of the protests we've now data set, or about 16% of the protests since the pandemic began um, have been linked directly within our data set to the pandemic. Um, but many of them, you know, the pandemic, the, the situation it's caused has been an underlying variable, um, you know, putting stress on state capacity to provide for its citizens, you know, again, not unique to Central Asia by any means, um, but, you know, forming the sort of underlying basis for individuals to um, ask for, uh, uh, you know, assistance with loans or assistance with housing, you know, um, often we've sort of where, where protest has explicitly linked it to COVID, you know, um, we, we, we coded it as COVID, but of course, you know, in many cases, you know, there were COVID-19 was an underlying factor. So, you know, the underlying conditions remain the same. So I would think, you know, it's difficult to make predictions but I would think the trajectory of, of sort of at least an elevated level of protest, whether they'll continue to increase at the rate we've seen within our data set is, is remains to be seen. Um, but certainly the underlying protest driving many of these uh, underlying conditions, sorry, driving many of these protests have remained the same. Um, and so we can, we can expect them to, um, to, to, in, to continue at this elevated level uh, going forward. Um, less, you know, there's, there's some sort of major change. Um, so, you know, most, as I said, violence has been relatively, you know, minimal um, in, in response to protesters. Um, 
you know, I think 17% in Kazakhstan, 4% in Kyrgyzstan. Um, so overall in the entire data set, you know, somewhere in the region of about 10% of the protests have been violently suppressed. Um, but obviously we now have questions over the extent to which that will continue in somewhere like Kyrgyzstan, where we have a new government, uh, a new strongman in power, uh, Sadir Jabarov, who is yet to, um, you know, face significant protests um, and sort of obviously has only been president for just over a month at this point. Um, but obviously, as he perhaps struggles to deliver on some of his very vague promises, we can expect that there's a potential for protests to develop. And it remains to be seen, you know, how his government would respond to, you know, uh, sort of uh, mass protests uh, against central government. And so, you know, the, the, the evidence thus far, although of course it's difficult to make predictions would indicate that, you know, his, his, his security forces would maybe be more willing to use violence than, than some of the predecessors. So that's certainly something to continue to watch. So I think, you know, I think what we can expect is, is continued protests um, across the region. Um, in terms of sort of policy recommendations, again, a very, it's a very sort of big topic. So, you know, it's difficult to make specific recommendations. Um, uh, but obviously, you know, a number of the issues that people are protesting around can be addressed. You know, I had a, a meeting um, with, with, with the ambassador um, of Uzbekistan here in Washington last week, and we were discussing some of the, the protests in Uzbekistan. Um, and, you know, he was saying that there's certainly an awareness and a willingness on the side of the government to uh, um, address issues of, of sort of gas, gas supplies, utility supplies in, in Uzbekistan. Um, so, um, you know, that's something that, that, that is, is something that people, that governments can attempt to address um, or addressing, for example, the, the welfare demands of mothers with multiple children in Kazakhstan. So there are a number of, you know, there are a number of these issues that, that can be addressed. Um, and um, you know, there's a number of solutions that can be adopted. I think second to sort of, uh, for the governments to embrace protests as a sign of a more open society. As I said, the fact that there are fewer protests in Tajikistan and Turkmenistan doesn't necessarily mean the governments there are doing a better job. You know, protests should be part of a, a sort of healthy, um, open society. People should be able to go out and voice their opposition to different issues. Um, um, and so, you know, the fact that there are more protests in the country, you know, points, potentially points to, you know, the system being more open. But of course, you know, most all of the governments in the region, with the exception of Kyrgyzstan have, whilst the constitutions guarantee a right to peaceful assembly, to protest uh, the laws on peaceful assembly, even the new law that was adopted just before the pandemic around about this time, uh, I guess it was passed by parliament during, during the pandemic. Um, in Kazakhstan, obviously, you know, um, doesn't guarantee um, freedom of, of peaceful assembly. You know, you still have to apply to local authorities uh, for permission to hold a, a demonstration. Um, you still, if you've been charged with participating in a protest historically, you're um, not able to, you're, you're not able to protest. Um, again, you know, the, the fines are obviously quite draconian. So, you know, there's a need Again, these are these are all very lofty po policy relevant recommendations. And obviously, there's a need to reform the laws on, on peaceful assembly, um, and also, you know, I think fourth, sort of allowing greater space for conventional politics. Um, you know, con by conventional politics, you mean sort of participating in elections and various other sort of legal means. Um, you know, that would obviously um, potentially um, lead to. Uh, a decrease, or at least one of the demands of one of many of the protest movements in Kazakhstan, um, which has been obviously to be able to hold free and fair elections and, and have a government that's um, transparent and accountable. It's one way to decrease the, uh, the protest mood. Um, and then obviously, you know, from our findings, violence on both sides, violent, violence begets violence, right? Use of violence by protesters leads to a violent response by the government. And oftentimes a violent response by the government to protesters leads to violence from their side. So, um, you know, I think um, avoiding violence on both sides is, uh, is, 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 is something that would be desirable. But with that, I will, I will stop and 
turn it over to the discussion. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Edward, for such a fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, um, this uh, data set that you have created is really unique, and I'm sure that it will be useful for many scholars who are involved in research on Central Asia and will be using for uh, different um, studies. Uh, th thank you so much, and I want to open the uh, Q&A session, and we've got a line of questions in the chat. Uh, so, for instance, Muldir Kasimbek asks, um, in your opinion, uh, Professor Lemon, what uh, is the main purpose of the protesters? So what was the main purpose of the protesters? And uh, I would like just to, to jump in and join this question asking, like, uh, how can we explain uh, the spike in the protests uh, that recently we observe across Central Asia? Is it about permissive conditions that uh, have been created? Or is it because of the demonstration effect, maybe, you know, some from other countries or um, kind of structural things or institutional? What would be your response? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very difficult to answer those, those questions because I said, you know, I think, you know, I think it's going to be useful as we go forward and we're planning a special issue with, 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 with various of the, the authors that I listed who are going out there and interviewing protesters, right, and then doing, doing the work here. So I think, you know, I think this data set is good at mapping out patterns um, and we can say certain things, but, you know, I think it's going to be fruitful to have a collaboration with them, you know, and I think it is a combination of, you know, the, the uptick in protests is a combination of, as I said, what's been called in the literature political opportunity structures, which are sort of, you know, the, the um, sort of space that you have the tolerance for protests, for example, in the country, you know, that has increased. I think it's increased in 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 both, you know, Kazakhstan and and Uzbekistan in particular. Kyrgyzstan sort of continued in, in historically and, and continues to be sort of the most sort of tolerant of protests. But I think we've seen, you know, we've seen the government, um, you know, tolerating protests in a way that you know wasn't the case certainly a decade ago, or even five years ago, right? So I think that's that's one of the major factors, um, although, you know, it's, it's gonna be interesting to combine our data to, to with the people who've sort of interviewed people and as to why they've gone to protests. I think the demonstration effect is certainly something that we've seen in the literature on colored revolutions, right? The sort of diffusion concept, right? The fact that protesters in Kyrgyzstan in 2005 sort of were copying and inspired by what was happening in Ukraine and Georgia beforehand. Um, we're obviously seeing the protests this year in the context, as you said, of what's going on in particularly in Belarus, but also in, in Russia more recently. Um, you know, I think, you know, we've seen certain evidence of, of, of sort of people openly invoking those links. Um, but, you know, I think our data set can't really prove that that's happening, you know, um, and that really diffusion is taking place. Um, you know, I think there's a certain, you know, from my 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 instinct is that you know these are these are distinct, you know, distinct phenomena that are, that are driven more by local conditions. You know, and I think you know that the other thing that I think has led to an up uptick in protests, um, you know, as I said, is the sort of the pandemic and the the strains that that's placed on governments. Um, you know, as, as a, and sort of some of the the uh, difficulties that the government's having in providing welfare. Um, so I think that's also that's also a factor. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I will probably also ask um, students who raise their hands and Camila Smagulova is uh, in line and then I will uh, take the question from the chat. Please, Camila. Good evening, Professor. Good evening, Professor Lemon. So thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Uh, to what extent data transparency was an issue for you because as we all know accessing this kind of a data that you have presented in your work is kind of complex so to what extent it affected data collection process for you and another question can is it possible to cite your work for some of our papers uh, that we write for our courses at gspp if yes how could we access this so this would be great if you could tell that thank you Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I think in terms of data transparency, you know, this data set is in terms of our transparency is you can download it, right? You can see, you can scrutinize it. You can, you can, you can, you can check our work. You know, we, we, we encourage people. We want this to be collaborative. If we've missed, if we've missed protests, we want people to sort of raise, raise, raise those missing cases. In some cases, we put the location of protests in the wrong place and someone pointed that out, which is fantastic. So in case of our, our transparency, you know, we're, we're, we're committed to being sort of open and making this accessible for people to to play around with and, and to use for their their research. If you want to cite us, you know, we we 
thus far because it's so early in the project we've we've sort of released all this data but we haven't managed we haven't got any peer-reviewed publications we're in the works they're in the works but um at this point we have a number of reports you can find on our website i'll drop it into chat or i can uh, email it to, to professor sharipova and she can she can share it so if you go on the oxussociety.org or oxussociety.org you can find some of our, our reports based on the initial findings our latest report from uh the latest release of the data in in january sort of has some of the, the findings that i talked about today um, also our code book and other things are all available there in terms of you know the the accessibility of this of the, of the data to collect for the protests you know i think you know we did our best to be exhaustive you know searching through um websites for certain keywords using local language sources um, russian and english um you know but you know there's always because it's human and we we're working maybe to work to have like a machine learning way of doing this like a scraping scraping tool but um at, at present we're just relying on a, a group of mostly sort of young researchers who are spending their evenings searching through protests and, and sort of logging them into a into a into a google spreadsheet um so certainly you know there are there are, there are going to be sources that we've missed um, we try and be as exhaustive as possible but of course you know we can't capture every single every single one plus i think you know as i said before you know certainly there are going to be protests and other things that are happening that aren't deemed newsworthy right and so they're not reported on and so we can't um, capture them in our data set so you know i think you know i think i think there's some of the limitations we try and be honest about Okay, another question is from uh, Christoph Moore, who is the head of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Kazakhstan. And he has a question, do you see protests driving political transformation? If so, to which extent? If public space is opening up and you've pointed that out more protesters, protests arise, but does this manifest in political changes? Or is it the other way around in the sense of political transformation created from top down is leading to more protests as people now have more ownership and expectations? Uh, great question. Um, you know, I think we've obviously seen during the time frame of our data set one major transformation that's taken place as a result of protests, which was obviously, you know, the, the overthrow of the Jean Beckel government, which was precipitated by, you know, a wave of wave of protests against the election results on the, you know, the, that Sunday, like it was Sunday evening, right? Maybe Saturday evening, anyway, um, you know, where the White House was stormed and, and the government sort of fell and we had that sort of situation of, of sort of multiple people claiming, claiming to be prime minister. So I think that's an obvious example of, of the protesters enacting political change, whether it be that positive or negative, you know, I, I think the jury is still out and I would generally say sort of the evidence points towards that outcome, maybe being a, you know, a net negative for, for Kyrgyzstan. Um, depends on your perspective, of course. Um, but what I, I think your your second point is is you know is is maybe the one that we've seen particularly in a place like Uzbekistan, which is, you know, um, at this at this point more, uh, you know, the Mirziyoyev government opening up a space for protests, um, and you know we've not. Of course, it's very difficult, um, and we haven't really done this yet to sort of map sort of and do like a process tracing of, of sort of you know how protests affect like political policies um, you know we haven't we haven't really we haven't really done that yet and you know it's, it's a difficult task to do but certainly very interesting um, you know so it's difficult to say the extent to which you know the protests in Uzbekistan are you know in that forcing major change and often I think what we're seeing you know with the exception of Kazakhstan really many of the certainly the protests in the other and, and I guess Kyrgyzstan as well but many of the protests in Uzbekistan for example are really just local issues right there about specific issues of people's housing um, welfare um, utilities you know it's more about these basic needs rather than you know there have been very few protests sort of didn't even think any protests really targeting the central government um, under Mirziyoyev calling for mass political reforms you know so I think that's you know that's something that one, one would hope will come but you know it's, it's not coming yet okay thank you edward uh, and the next question is uh, by aslan tanikenov tanikenov uh, aslan we we don't hear you you are muted <laughs> 
Uh, sorry, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Edward, thank you for your presentation so far, and uh, the topic is quite sensitive, and there are few scholars actually doing any research. So I think that um, it has, a, as a, uh, earlier you noted, the practical implications as well. In your presentation, you did a coding, uh, coding on geocoding and uh, coding by topic, yeah? And uh, was there any intention to see the correlation of uh, uh, geographic, geographic protest acti activeness and, uh, and the reason behind by topic? I mean, just what was the reason of uh, doing a geocoding? Yeah. That's my first question. And second question, uh, do you think there could be like um, protest disappointment uh, in Central Asia, looking the, back the case of Belarus or Khabarsk in Russia? Yeah, no, I think, you know, the first reason we did the geocoding is so that we could put it on a map and sort of do something that was sort of uh, interactive and, and you know, um, visually appealing for, for people. Um, the second reason we geocoded was so that we could look at sort of interaction between location, right, and the response. So we could look at sort of, you know, whether having a protest in Bishkek would result in a more violent response, which is something that we found. Um, we didn't, I don't think, create, we didn't create a regression that looked at location and issue. I think that's interesting. We did try and, within our model, play around with issue and response, like what type of response that the target uh, adopted, you know, thinking that, you know, if you're gonna have a protest, let's say intuitively, if you're gonna have a protest maybe on human rights, maybe the reaction would be more, more violent. Whereas if you're gonna have a protest on a more benign issue, um, like utilities, maybe it would be more constructive, but we didn't find statistically significant results to report. But as we build out the data set more and more, have more observations, maybe that will. Maybe that will change, but I think it'll be interesting. Yeah, that's certainly certainly a good idea to see sort of, obviously we already have these patterns, right? Where obviously most protests in Kyrgyzstan related to the environment, related to mining, for example, you know, they're happening in rural areas, for example, whereas most protests probably, you know, I think we could say most protests related to um, political reform and human rights, that they're happening in large urban spaces, right? When we have these, these protests that have often taken place in the same day in Kazakhstan, right? They've taken place in, at least they've been reported to have taken place in the major cities, right? Shimkent and um, Almaty, uh, Los Sultan. Um, in terms of protest disappointment, yeah, I think that's certainly, that's certainly, you know, a potential issue. Um, you know, I think we haven't, I guess there's, there's a few sort of repeat protests that we've been tracking, um, for example, even yesterday. You know, there's been a weekly march in Bishkek for sort of constitutional reform. It happened again yesterday mm -hmm. for the, maybe, maybe it's been happening ever since October, I think. Um, and, you know, it's, it'll be interesting to see. It's quite a small group, you know, so, you know, it's interesting to see how much longer um, that they're going to keep going. Um, yeah, it's going to be, it's difficult, difficult to predict. Um, but I think certainly, certainly um, potential sort of, there's the potential for certain movements to lose momentum. Um, you're certainly right. Right. Uh, sorry, Dina, uh, can you just minor point? Uh, so, uh, what I noticed from your presentation, when I look at this diagram about this topic of the presentations, or oh, sorry, the protest topics, uh, I noticed that um, the issue of land uh, was not in a case in Kazakhstan. Uh, four or five years ago, when there was a, a rumor that the land of, uh, will be sold to the China, and the Western and some regions, your geolocation of what we very well worked actually, some regions were very active. Mm -hmm. And you know that a few a few months ago, one of the protesters who was present released uh, Bokai from the mm -hmm. Western mm -hmm. Pakistan activists. So I think um, the land issue, if you look at the South, West and Central part of Kazakhstan, they were active, but North was less. So that was interesting. I mean, just uh, what's the reason? I don't know, but geographically, the activation process was quite different. Yes, thank you. Arslan, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Edward, be before you start uh, answering the question, uh, Mayrim also asked similar question. She uh, is asking about anti-Chinese protests in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. according to the Oxus protest data, uh, there have been a lot of protests in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan that are anti-Chinese. Do you think it's directly linked to, with Chinese presence? or it is more to do with internal politics of the countries? I mean, Sure, sure. sure. Um, I think the land issue is an interesting one, right? I think that was the first sort of, at least for many decades, that was the sort of largest protest that had occurred in, in Kazakhstan, right? And so, you know, I think, you know, I just ranked the top five. I, I, 
can't think off the top of my head how many land protests we've coded in Kazakhstan. Um, that might be another interesting, you know, I, I think your suggestion to, to, to talk about the interaction between geographic location and protest type is, is probably, sorry, protest issue um, is, is probably an interesting one, obviously, because, you know, many of the, the protests to do with land are obviously taking place in, in, in rural areas. Um, so, you know, that might be an interesting, interesting way to sort of map sort of, you know, sort of different protest moods, like within within the country, right, as you say, like Western Kazakhstan or, you know, um, Jambul or Blast, right, somewhere down on the border with China. Um, so that's certainly, you know, I think that's, that's uh, an interesting thing for us to look at going forward. Um, and, you know, we welcome if people want to use our data set and, and you know, um, play with it themselves and, 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 uh, and do some of this analysis, that would be fantastic. That's very, that's what we created it for. So, um, and in terms of the, the anti-Chinese protests, yeah, they, we, we sort of coded one of our 28 issue types was China related protests. Um, and we saw, I think we've seen 112, if I'm not mistaken. So around 10%, well, I just don't know, I guess under 8% of the protests have occurred um, with some sort of mobilization around China. Um, it's mostly been against sort of Chinese investments. Uh, Chinese mining projects in Kyr Kyr Kyrgyzstan, for example, uh, oil and gas projects in, in, in Kazakhstan. Um, a smaller number of protests related to the situation in Xinjiang. Um, and, you know, uh, in obviously we've seen most of the protests in Kyrgyzstan and, and Kazakhstan, um, you know, be that because, you know, the societal levels, as we know from polling data in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are more anti-Chinese. That might be one explanation for that, um, you know, along with obviously having a larger Uyghur and, and Dungan population, um, maybe shaping some of the protests related to Xinjiang. In fact, there's been an ongoing protest, some of you may have noticed outside the Chinese embassy, the Chinese consulate uh, in Almaty um, against the detention of Herbert. Uh, ethnic, ethnic Kazakhs and Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang. So certainly, you know, it's, it's, China has been the major international actor that has been the subject of protests in Central Asia. We haven't, we've seen some mobilizations against France right after the uh, comments of Macron, uh, after the, the murder of, of the school teacher. Um, and we saw some protests against the United States and one or two related to Russia, but on the whole, China has been sort of the major external actor that's been subject to protests. Okay, thank you, Edward. I think that we can take a couple of more questions. Yeah, I, I went over. I realized because I couldn't see my clock that I'd spoken too. I got too excited and spoke no, too no, much. No, no, I mean it, it's uh, very interesting. But I mean, if people are around, I have time. I mean, it's early in the morning here. I don't know what you're asking. Okay, so um, Nurkent Leov uh, is asking: Historically, the regions of Central Asia are not distinguished by high uh, process. Okay, why do you think there is an increase in protest activity? I think that you covered uh, to some extent this uh, question. Um, is it connected with the increase in the education of the population, the influence of the current events in the world, or the living conditions in Kazakhstan itself? So it's particularly about Kazakhstan. I mean, I think that's, again, a difficult, difficult question to answer with our data set, right? There are people, there was an interesting paper um, in Central Asian survey by a group of Kazakh scholars about a year ago that sort of looked at, for example, well, they did a survey of students, for example, and asked them, why, why do you protest? Or do you protest? And if so, why? You know, so I think there's some, some of those sort of studies that are getting to those questions. There are also studies using things like the World Values Survey, right, where as part of that survey worldwide, people are asked about what protest activity they um, take part in, as well as some information about their educational background, so, so socio-demographic factors, you know, um, and so those sort of uh, studies can get at, get at some of these questions. You know, I think, again, it depends on the issue of what people are mobilizing around. We're obviously seeing, you know, the protests in Kazakhstan related to reform are often obviously um, more sort of urban middle class, um, you know, from what we can see. Um, often Russian speaking, but also, you know, increasingly, you know, these movements are also doing, doing a lot of work in, in Kazakhstan and there's Kazakh language, sorry. And there's, uh, you know, some literature on this, uh, but you know, when we're looking at mobilization around gas issues in Kyrgyzstan, sorry, in, in Uzbekistan, you know, that's often rural people, as I said, women. Um, so I think, you know, I think education may play a role, um, 
it's of course that's a very long term uh, factor I think you know uh, new technologies is something that also plays a role and we've seen some of these you know um, we've seen some of these movements uh, emerging in Kazakhstan obviously using Instagram and and, and lots of other uh, TikTok and other things you know to be more appealing to younger people um, you know so I think that I think I think for me the most the most important thing you know and again it's it's something we're still sort of working on is the sort of maybe the change in the as i said the political opportunity structure um since since uh nazabayev um, uh, retired mm -hmm. okay thank you edward uh, there are many questions uh, related to the reasons of uh, again the protest some uh, people asking uh, do you think that it's about changes in norms um in the countries uh, um, what is, what's the question? Changing norms, I think it was. I can't find this question. <laughs> okay, uh, during your research, have you noticed a difference in purpose of protest depending on the economic situation in the countries? Can uh, Central Asian governments use the pandemic as a modern approach to dealing with local protests? Yeah, I mean, I think we have seen an uptick in protests, as I said, in 2020. I think we've also seen obviously the region fall into recession so like across the region for the first time since the 1990s where it's first time in first time in over 20 years that the overall gdp of the region didn't grow last year um you know we've obviously seen um countries countries struggling with that and that's sort of been one of the major drivers from what we can see of you know protests related to welfare protests related to income uh, you know they've often been you know protests related to the financial sector in terms of people asking for loan forgiveness or lower interest rates on loans you know so that's certainly been um you know we haven't done a sort of um a real analysis of you know, the dependent variable for us in terms of in the analysis we've done thus far has been, you know, what affects the protest type, sorry, the, protest, the response type. We haven't done sort of an analysis of with, with the protests themselves as the, the existence of the protests as the dependent variables. That's, that's certainly something to, to look into um, uh, going forward. Um, but obviously, yeah, I have the sense that economic um, factors certainly play a significant role in in, in mobilization around around certain issues. Okay, thank you, Edward. I, Rast, okay, I guess uh, maybe we can take one more question. I know that uh, you've been with us for quite a bit of time. Uh, so, uh, Enrique Alimhan is asking, uh, how does tracker of protest can prevent protest in the future? <laughs> And do you think uh, protest activities sometimes can be positive due to future changes in the government? I missed the first part of the question, sir. The first part is, uh, how does uh, the, the, this you know, data set or the tracker of protests that you've created can prevent protests? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure it can. I mean, it depends if people are, people are looking at this thing. Um, you know, I think, I think hopefully, you know, um, and although it's very lofty, um, you know, the, some of the policy sort of recommendations and, you know, if we can help communicate as I did the other day with the ambassador from Uzbekistan and, and talk about some of the dynamics that are going on, uh, which I'm sure he already knows. Um, but, you know, the extent to which, you know, we can um, work with the governments and the extent to which they're receptive to, you know, us sort of and other researchers mapping the patterns of protest and saying, you know, these are the certain issues that people are raising, you know, maybe some of them, you know, can be addressed in these different ways. You know, that, that could be one way. It's very lofty. I, I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, but obviously, we would welcome, we would obviously welcome uh, people taking notice of our research within the governments, like any, like any other researcher. Um, but obviously, that that's quite difficult, difficult to achieve. Um, and in terms of the positive aspects of protests, yes, I think, you know, um, you know, I think in many cases, as I said, protests, the fact that there have been more protests in Uzbekistan, I would say is a positive sign um, because before people were scared, right? This is something we hear time and time again of voicing any sort of criticism of the government. And now they feel emboldened enough to be able to, you know, at least protest certain issues, right? I feel, I feel like, as I said, you know, the protests haven't been targeting Mirzioyev himself, right? And they haven't been targeting even the central government in most cases. They're mostly targeting local government. But 
even that was unimaginable in 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 in, in Karimov's time. Mm-hmm. And in Kazakhstan, you know, I think you know, I would say the the increase in protests, you know, is overall sort of pointing to the emergence of a more open society, um, a society that you know is is able and and uh, sort of willing to express its discontent publicly. Um, so I would say overall, in many cases, protests can be a positive, positive uh, development. Although, of course, it depends on from whose perspective. Okay, Edward, thank you so much for your interesting presentation and uh, interesting data set that you are compiling right now. And I'm sure that um, Uh, local scholars also probably will be using it. Uh, we are fascinated because uh, nobody has done um, before. And uh, maybe you just say a few words about the OXA Society because I'm oh. sure that uh, many people uh, would like them to become. Oh, I, I see the cat. <laughs> yes, the cat, the cat is here. Let's make it this cameo. Might become uh, members of this uh, OXA Society on Central Asia. Sure. Fantastic. Yes. And as I say, you know, um, maybe. Professor Sharipova can can share the link to the protest tracker afterwards. I could put it in chat, but then it would be lost after the call ends. Um, so yeah, we we sort of uh, welcome welcome you to use the data set, play around with it, um, make suggestions. Um, you know, and this, as I said, is a is a project that has been a collaboration between myself and others, um, including some from the region. Um, and so you know, we welcome if people want to become involved. You know, we, we, we welcome sort of uh, people who want to join the team and, and become more involved in studying these issues. You know, that is our, that is our approach is to, to be open and to have sort of collaboration on, the, on these issues. But OXA Society was launched in October. Um, as I say, we're, we're a new platform for debate and discussion on key issues within Central Asia. Our website has a number of different initiatives. We've been mapping out um, sort of articles that have been written by scholars from Central Asia um, and books. Dr. Sharipova's book is in our data set, for example, a number of her articles um, as a way to sort of showcase local knowledge, because I think within the global production of, of, of knowledge within, uh, within academia, you know, we've often had this hierarchy between the West and regions like Central Asia. And so we really wanted to break down some of these hierarchies, um, showcase the great work that's being done by scholars from the region, um, not only in English, but in local languages as well. Um, and, you know, in our philosophy, you know, working on projects like this, you know, even though I presented today, um, you know, members of the team are from Central Asia, they played a key role in devising the data set. In fact, they did the regression analysis, um, which I presented today, um, they came up with that themselves. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to sort of break down some of these barriers. We also have a, sort of articles on our website, shorter articles, if you're working on a topic, for example, that you think is interesting based on your research, you know, we welcome, we welcome people to uh, submit short articles to us, like a thousand words. Um, and we also have a researcher directory, which is supposed to be a sort of searchable database of uh, experts uh, who work uh, on, on the region. You know, we don't require that you have a PhD, um, but you know, having a, an MA um, and working on a particular issue is, is sort of sufficient to to be included. Um, so, you know, we welcome we welcome uh, we, we we want we want you to become involved. Basically, uh, in short, um, you know, this is a this is a sort of uh, collaborative project, a community. We have a number of events um, throughout the year. Um, discussions around these issues and we're planning more sort of closed events like this um, so you know we we basically check out our website and see if you the ways in which you want to become involved okay edward uh, thank you so much for your very interesting and insightful presentation and we would like to wish you uh good luck and uh good luck with all your uh, future and further projects and hope that we also can have some collaboration uh, between the universities and as uh, you know Western and uh, uh, Central Asian scholars. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, we'll have to do this again. Thank you, Professor. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for everyone for coming. Thanks a lot.